200 years ago, America was a very different place than it is today. All the land west of the Mississippi River was a vast, undiscovered wilderness that President Thomas Jefferson had just bought from France. In 1803, he decided to send an army expedition west to find out what was in the Louisiana Purchase. He wanted to know if the Indians there were friendly, and if there was a Northwest Passage, an easy way to cross America by river. Hi, I'm George Shannon. As a teenager, I was the youngest soldier to join one of the most important scientific explorations in American history. This is the story of the Lewis and Clark Expedition. On February 28, 1803, the U.S. Congress appropriated $2,500 for a small army unit to explore all the land between the Mississippi River and the Pacific Ocean. To lead what he called the Corps of Discovery, President Jefferson selected a close friend, 28-year-old Meriwether Lewis. Lewis was an army captain. As a boy, he spent hours playing in the woods, so President Jefferson felt he would be a perfect expedition leader. Captain Lewis felt the expedition was so important, he needed someone to help him lead it. He chose his former army commander, 32-year-old William Clark. William Clark was six feet tall, had red hair, and a love for geography. The Lewis and Clark expedition was the only American military operation ever commissioned with two commanders. Preparing for the monumental journey took a lot of planning. Captain Clark recruited young woodsmen and soldiers willing to volunteer for the dangerous adventure. While Captain Lewis bought the instruments he would need to map the unknown frontier, he also bought the medicine, rifles, and hatchets and knives we would need on the long journey. He also bought many trinkets to trade with the Indians along the way. Captain Clark brought his personal servant along on the expedition, a black slave named York and Captain Lewis purchased a 160-pound dog named Seaman to accompany him to the Pacific. By the spring of 1804, the expedition assembled at the mouth of the Missouri River near St. Louis. I was one of 22 soldiers, three sergeants, and an interpreter named George Drouillard, who would accompany Lewis and Clark across the wilderness. We officially began the Lewis and Clark expedition on May 14, 1804. Our orders were to follow the rivers west, map a water route to the Pacific, and get to know the Native American tribes in the west. At first we started up the Missouri River in a 55 foot long keel boat, and two smaller boats called Piros. That summer was hot, and it took a lot of work to make our way against the current. Sunken trees, sandbars, collapsing riverbanks, and sudden wind squalls all slowed our progress. One of our sergeants, Charles Floyd, died from a mysterious illness not long after leaving St. Louis. We buried him on a hilltop overlooking the Missouri River. From the very beginning, the expedition turned out to be more difficult than we had first thought. As we made our way into the upper Missouri, we entered the territory of the Teton Sioux. They were a fierce tribe that were known for plundering white traders. On September 25th, we were forced into a three-day standoff with the Sioux when they tried to stop our boats. Although we were outnumbered three to one, Captain Lewis threatened them with our guns and they finally allowed us to sail on. All that summer, Captain Lewis cataloged the plants and animals we found along the way and used the ship's sextant to take detailed sightings. Captain Clark charted the river's course and mapped the land. After 164 days, our progress was slow. We were just one third of the way across the continent and winter was approaching. As our Corps of Discovery got to the boundary of known civilization, Captains Lewis and Clark ordered us to make camp near the Mandan Indian villages. We built a fort near a grove of cottonwood trees and named it Fort Mandan. And just in time, because on December 12th the temperature dropped to 38 below and the Missouri River froze solid. We spent five months at Fort Mandan, waiting out the winter, 
and gathering information about the route ahead. The Mandans were especially interested in Captain Clark's servant, York. They had never seen a black man. To the Indians, York was considered powerful medicine. It was at Fort Mandan that the captains hired a French-Canadian trapper named Toussaint Charbonneau to guide us west. Charbonneau's wife, a Shoshone Indian named Sacagawea, spoke the language of the Western Indians, which none of us understood. We would quickly realize that having her with us was a sign to other Native Americans that we came in peace. When the ice broke on the Missouri in March, 1805, a kill boat loaded with the artifacts we had collected so far headed back to St. Louis, and our expedition continued upriver with three new members, Charbonneau, Sacagawea, and their newborn son, Jean-Baptiste. As we moved on past the Yellowstone River, we saw immense herds of buffalo, elk, deer, and antelope. At one point, grizzly bears charged them in, hunting them, and Captain Lewis said that he would rather fight two Indians than one bear. During one fierce windstorm, a boat that carried important instruments nearly capsized, but Sacagawea saved many items as they floated by. By the end of May, the Great Rocky Mountains came into view. The river's current grew stronger, and we had to abandon our paddles and tow the heavy canoes from the shoreline with rawhide ropes. When riverbanks gave way to cliffs, we had to wade in the water, pushing and pulling the boats upstream. In early June, we reached the Great Falls of the Missouri, the most difficult object we had yet encountered on the expedition. It took us 31 days of backbreaking labor under a blistering sun to carry our boats and supplies 18 miles around those falls. To help, we attached wheels to the canoes and pulled them over land. By July 26, 1805, we arrived at a place where the Missouri divided into three forks. By the middle of August, we reached a spring in the mountains that Captain Lewis called the most distant fountain of the Missouri. Just beyond that, we saw the towering mountains of the west. A brook there ran westward, and we realized that we had crossed the continental divide. It was a disappointing sign for us. We could see the mountains ahead, and now we knew for sure that there was no direct easy all-water route to the Pacific. We would now have to abandon our boats and find horses to carry us over the high, rugged mountains. But just as our prospects looked bleak, good luck came our way. As we searched for signs of the Shoshone tribe along the Jefferson River, Sacagawea recognized the country. When we made contact with the Indians, she discovered their chief was her brother. Sacagawea arranged for the captains to buy 29 pack horses from the Shoshone and to hire a guide to lead us west. In spite of their warnings that the trail ahead was a bad one, we headed on into the mountains. It turned out to be the worst possible crossing you could ever imagine. The weather turned very cold. We had to climb over trees that had fallen across the trail. Then, our Indian guide got lost. And always visible to the west were the jagged peaks of the Bitterroot Range that still stood between us and the Pacific Ocean. On September 11th, we finally found the Lolo Indian Trail and followed it into the Bitterroot Mountains. We thought we were now home free, but nothing we had faced so far could match the next nine days. First, a freak snowstorm hit. The river froze, and it was soon impossible to move through the dense snowpack. We became stranded. We wondered if the Lewis and Clark expedition would die there in the snowy bitter roots. When it finally stopped snowing, we made our way down the west slope of the mountains. By the time we reached the Nez Perce Indian village, we were half starved and discouraged, but we were all still alive. The Nez Perce gave us salmon, roots, and berries to eat. Their food made us sick, but it saved our lives. Crossing the bitter roots was the most difficult part of the expedition so far.
we hollowed out five ponderosa pine trees to make new canoes. On October the 5th, we set out on the last leg of our journey. Now it was downhill to the Pacific. But this too was no easy trip. The Clearwater River had rapids, making our progress fast but risky. Before long, we reached the Snake River. And then on October 16th, the Columbia. We were once again forced to carry our canoes around some falls on the Columbia, but we finally drifted into its quiet tide waters on November 2nd, 1805. Our journey to the Pacific was almost over. On November 7th, Captain Clark wrote, Great joy in camp as we are in view of the ocean, this great Pacific Ocean, which we've been so long anxious to see. We had been gone 554 days. We had traveled 4,132 miles made countless experiments, charted the many rivers we traveled, and collected specimens along the way. We were the first U.S. citizens to experience the Great Plains, to see the daunting peaks of the Rocky Mountains, and the first to reach the Pacific Ocean by land. Our stay on the West Coast was anything but hospitable. In the beginning, savage winds blew off the ocean, swells rolled up the river, and rain poured down we became stranded on the north side of the Columbia River. Soon we voted to cross to the south shore, where the Clatsop Indians told us that there would be elk and deer to hunt. Our decision to move camp was the first democratically held American election west of the Rockies, and it included both a woman, Sacagawea, and a black man, Captain Clark's servant, York. By Christmas time, we had built Fort Clatsop, where we would live through a miserable and rain-soaked winter. We hunted elk for food and used their hides to replace clothing and moccasins we had worn out on the journey west. During our winter on the Pacific coast, Captain Lewis filled his journals with descriptions of plants and animals he had collected. He recorded weather data and described the Indian cultures he had seen along the way. Captain Clark drew many illustrations of plants and animals and brought the maps of the journey up to date. But even music failed to cheer up the mood. We were all eager to begin our journey back home. On March 23rd, 1806, we packed up our experiments and specimens, acquired new canoes, and started back up the Columbia River. By June 30th, we had crossed the treacherous Bitterroots, and on September 23rd, we were back where the Lewis and Clark expedition had begun, in St. Louis. We returned to a hero's welcome. Both Captains Lewis and Clark became instant celebrities for leading this remarkable adventure. Shortly after our return, the Corps of Discovery quietly disbanded, and each of us went our separate ways. William Clark enjoyed a long and honorable career in St. Louis where today he lies buried in his family plot in Bellefontaine Cemetery. Meriwether Lewis would die mysteriously just three years after the expedition. Those who were there say he shot himself at a public roadhouse south of Nashville, Tennessee. Few women in American history are as legendary as Sacagawea, the only woman to travel on the expedition. Although she is believed to have died in 1812 at the age of 25, more statues, streams, lakes, landmarks, parks, songs, ballads, and poems honor this young Shoshone woman than any other. Her infant son, Jean Baptiste, was adopted by William Clark after the expedition. His father, Touchant Charbonneau, stayed among the Indians as an interpreter. Ten years after the expedition, Captain Clark's servant York was given his freedom. He went into the freighting business in Missouri. As the expedition's youngest member, I went on to attend law school and became a legislator in Kentucky, a state senator, and then a U.S. attorney in Missouri. The Lewis and Clark expedition might not have discovered what we had gone looking for in 1804, a northwest water passage across the continent, but it was the greatest adventure of our lives. 
And more importantly, we inspired other men to follow us, to explore the possibilities of the American West, and to discover what the vast wilderness held for future generations. For that alone, the Lewis and Clark expedition was a great accomplishment. <laughs>